All right. You can get the sound system. Are we working? We are. Great. So good morning, everyone. My name is Richard Barker. I'm the press officer currently for the United States Attorney's Office. We're going to go ahead and get started this morning. Um, it's my pleasure right now to introduce our U.S. Attorney, the first woman to fill that role, and somebody who's been a prosecutor in our office and has handled these cases um, as a, a line attorney in our office. Uh, again, my pleasure to introduce Vanessa Waldreff, our U.S. Attorney. Thank you, Rich. And thank you all for being here on this crisp morning. Today, we are here to talk about what my office and our law enforcement partners are doing to protect community health and patient safety. And I'm honored to be here with some amazing law enforcement partners who I'll name now and introduce more fully later. I have Assistant United States Attorney Tyler Tornabene, Assistant United States Attorney Dan Fruchter, Assistant Attorney General Doug Bowling, Larissa Payne, the Director of the Washington Attorney General Medicaid Fraud Control Division, Cody Raisinger, Special Agent with Health and Human Services Office of Inspector General, Special Agent Leonard Russo, also from Health and Human Services Office of Inspector General, Special Agent Mark Mellegrino, Office of Personnel Management, Office of Inspector General, and Derek Lindbaum, Special Agent with the Defense Criminal Investigative Service. Having affordable, quality health care is so critical to building and maintaining safe and strong communities here in Eastern Washington. Each one of us has had times where we have depended on health care professionals to deliver affordable, quality, and medically appropriate care. We need to trust our doctors and our hospitals. And we are so fortunate here in Eastern Washington to have world-class healthcare professionals and facilities. They make Washington great. The importance of high quality and affordable healthcare is why healthcare fraud is such a priority for my office. Healthcare fraud hurts the community. It diverts critical resources away from those who need them the most, the elderly, individuals with disabilities, and the underserved. Additionally, as we see in the case that we are highlighting today, when doctors, hospitals, and healthcare providers make care decisions based on how much they can bill instead of what is best for the patient, the lives and health of patients are put in danger. Healthcare fraud increases the premiums, co-pays, and deductibles that patients have to pay for care. And healthcare fraud also undermines confidence in the system. And it makes patients and providers who are trying to play by the rules have to deal with unnecessary and unfair red tape to get their legitimate needs taken care of. Many of our healthcare fraud cases also address critical issues such as elder fraud abuse and the opioid crisis. We will not tolerate health care fraud in the Eastern District. The case and the $22.7 million settlement that we are highlighting today is a perfect example of why fighting health care fraud is so important. Providence is the largest care provider in all of Washington and one of the largest in the Western United States. Providence St. Mary's Medical Center in Walla Walla is a critical hospital resource, not only for Walla Walla, but for Southeastern Washington, Eastern Oregon, and the Idaho Panhandle. This settlement resolves allegations that between 2013 and 2018, Providence St. Mary's and two of its neurosurgeons performed and falsely billed Medicaid, Medicare, and other federal health programs for medically unnecessary neurosurgery procedures. The settlement involves allegations that two neurosurgeons and Providence failed to provide appropriate 
and adequate care for these patients and expose them to serious danger and even serious bodily harm. The settlement also resolves allegations that Providence paid the neurosurgeons in a manner that incentivized them to perform too many overly complex surgeries too quickly, despite being warned that it was endangering patient lives and safety. The settlement also involves allegations of serious harm to patients caused by dangerous, risky, and medically unnecessary spinal surgery procedures performed by two neurosurgeons that failed to meet the appropriate standard of care. Some of the St. Mary's patients that the neurosurgeons operated on are here in attendance today, and I am so appreciative of that. There are other patients who desperately wanted to be in attendance today, but are simply too injured to make the trip in their current condition, and so others are here in their stead. I want to especially recognize the courage and determination of these and other patients and the hurt and the pain that they have experienced. They are a crucial reminder of how healthcare fraud is not about numbers on a ledger or dollars in a bank account, but it undermines the strength and safety of our communities. It hurts our neighbors, our relatives, our coworkers and friends. My office will continually, aggressively pursue healthcare fraud with that simple but important reminder as our lodestar. Today's settlement of nearly $22.7 million is the largest ever healthcare fraud settlement in the Eastern District of Washington. But what makes this case and this resolution significant is not just the money. The most important aspect is the critical impact on patient safety and the fact that through this investigation and resolution, we have been able to protect our community from danger and harm in the future. I also want to focus on five additional reasons I think this case is so important. First, acceptance of responsibility. Second, corrective action. Third, cooperation. Fourth, the critical role of whistleblowers. And fifth, well, we couldn't do this without our very important law enforcement partnerships. So first I'll talk about admission and acceptance of responsibility. Our office was not comfortable with permitting Providence to simply deny everything cut a check, and walk away. Rather, as part of the settlement, Providence accepted responsibility for and admitted that during the five years that these two neurosurgeons were employed at St. Mary's, Providence medical staff, including the director of the neurosurgery department, communicated concerns that the neurosurgeons were harming patients and endangering patient safety were performing medically unnecessary and dangerous surgeries, that they had falsified and exaggerated diagnoses in order to get Medicare and other insurance providers to pay for the procedures, and that these neurosurgeons overoperated, which has performed a more complex and risky surgery than was medically appropriate. So Providence admitted that it paid these neurosurgeons in a manner that incentivized them to perform a high volume of complex surgeries. And that through this pay structure, one of the neurosurgeons received between 2.5 million and 2.7 million per year between 2014 and 2017. Providence further admitted that when it eventually performed independent reviews of the neurosurgeons, it allowed both of them to resign rather than terminating them and did not report either neurosurgeon to appropriate state or federal regulatory bodies who are responsible for safeguarding patient safety. And that meant 
that these physicians were able to go on operating elsewhere. Second, I want to talk about corrective action. My office will hold people accountable, but it's also so important that we make sure that nothing like this happens again. As part of the settlement, we required Providence to enter into a five-year corporate integrity and quality of care agreement. This separate agreement requires Providence to implement and maintain a number of quality of care and patient safety obligations. For example, for the next five years, Providence will be required to retain independent experts to perform annual reviews of Providence's billing and quality systems and to establish and implement robust compliance and quality training and procedures to ensure patient safety. These improvements and safeguards are not limited to St. Mary's, but will have benefits system-wide, meaning that we will all benefit from these increased protections. Third, I want to highlight cooperation. While I am extremely concerned about Providence's conduct and its failure to act more quickly and more aggressively to protect its patients and the community, I want to give Providence credit for stepping up during our investigation and providing its full cooperation. It is clear to me and my office that Providence had and has a sincere desire to address its past conduct as well as to prevent something like this from ever happening again. As the largest healthcare provider in Washington, Providence is a critically important partner and member of this community when it comes to protecting and saving lives. I want to commend Providence for taking its responsibility seriously and confronting some hard truths to try to make things right. Providence has agreed to provide full cooperation into our ongoing investigations. This cooperation has already involved and will continue to involve providing crucial information and assistance to support our ongoing investigations. And while I can't comment on the nature of our ongoing investigations or who might be subjects of those investigations, I can say that my office is fully committed to holding individuals that participated in fraud fully accountable using all the tools that are available to us. Providence's cooperation in our ongoing investigations will be an important tool in our pursuit of justice into those who are making money off of this dangerous fraud. And fourth, I want to talk about whistleblowers and the critical role they play in these cases and investigations. Like so many of our significant healthcare fraud matters, we learned of this situation from a concerned citizen who came forward and blew the whistle. In this case, the whistleblower was the former medical director of the neurosurgery department at St. Mary's. The False Claims Act recognizes that whistleblowers have a critical role to play when it comes to ferreting out and prosecuting fraud. And it provides whistleblowers with a strong financial incentive to come forward. In this case, as the False Claims Act provides, the whistleblower, the whistleblower will receive over $4 million of the settlement amount. For our hundreds of thousands of healthcare workers here in the Eastern District of Washington, if you have seen practices that you are not comfortable with, and if you believe that you have information about fraud or patient harm or abuse, we are listening. And we will pursue your information aggressively, and we will protect your identity until our investigation is complete. We will continue to work closely with brave whistleblowers to hold healthcare fraudsters accountable. Those who believe they have information about healthcare fraud can report it online to Health and Human Services OIG at oig.hhs.gov. Or you can file a whistleblower complaint 
under the False Claims Act, and we encourage you to do so. We need your courage, your expertise, and your truth to hold fraudsters accountable and keep our communities safe. And fifth, I want to commend our law enforcement partnerships. While my office has made health care fraud an important priority, we are not doing it and we cannot do it alone. We are so blessed to have such wonderful law enforcement partner partners in our critical health care fraud work. We work hand in glove with these agencies in the Providence case, and I am so glad that they are able to join us here today. So first, I want to commend our state partners at the Washington State Medicaid Fraud Control Division. The Medicaid Fraud Control Division is part of Attorney General Bob Ferguson's office, and we are incredibly fortunate to have their strong support and partnership in this and other critical cases. In a few moments, you will hear from Larissa Payne, the director of the Medicaid Fraud Control Division in the Attorney General's office. In cases like this, involving fraud or abuse involving Medicaid, we work closely with Larissa's team at the Medicaid Fraud Control Division to leverage all the tools that the state and the United States have to fight fraud. In this case, we were especially fortunate to work with Assistant Attorney General Jeremy Kelly, based right here in Spokane. And I want to thank Attorney General Ferguson and Director Payne for their support and partnership. Second, the United States Department of Health and Human Services Office of Inspector General investigates fraud, waste, and abuse involving Medicaid and Medicare. In this case, we were incredibly fortunate to have not one, but two exceptional agents, Special Agent Len Russo and Cody Racinger with the Seattle Field Office. I want to recognize and thank both of them, as well as Assistant Special Agent in Charge Jeff McIntosh of the Seattle Field Office for their outstanding support and partnership in so many important cases. Third, we also had the Office of Personnel Management Office of Inspector General. This OIG office investigates cases involving health care programs that cover federal civilian employees. And we are very fortunate to have Special Agent Mark Malagrino of the Western Regional Office on this case. His interviewing and investigative skills were an incredible benefit to the investigation. And fourth, we had the defensive, excuse me, the defense Criminal Investigative Service, which investigates cases involving the TRICARE program, a health insurance program that covers military employees and retirees and their families. Our team was so fortunate to have two great agents from DCIS during the investigation. Chris Somboom, who is now the resident agent in charge of the Seattle Field Office and the Portland Office. My notes. And Special Agent Derek Lindbaum, who we've worked with on a number of important cases. I want to thank Chris and Derek for their exceptional support and work on this case and other cases. And last but not least, our investigation benefited greatly from logistical support provided by the Walla Walla Police Department in a number of important respects. I want to thank outgoing Chief Scott Beaver for that support over a long investigation that took our agents and attorneys far from home on many occasions. This case is important, but it is only part of the essential work that we are doing to fight health care fraud here in Eastern Washington. Over the past five years, the office has greatly expanded its health care fraud practice. My Deputy Criminal Chief Dan Fruchter and Affirmative Civil Enforcement Coordinator Tyler Tornabene have been incredible leaders in my office to build our dynamic fraud practice. We have added attorneys and technical staff, strengthened and expanded our partnerships, and directly engaged with the community to expand our footprint and develop new cases. As demonstrated by this case and others, we are doing good work, but there is much work still to be done. 
We will continue to work with our federal, state, local, tribal, and community partners to vigorously pursue health care fraud in eastern Washington and to build a safe and strong community right here. So I want to now introduce Larissa Payne, the director of the Medicaid Fraud Control Division. Larissa has been with Mufuku since uh, 2016, and she previously worked in New York combating health care fraud there. She has a background with the JAG Corps, and we are very fortunate to have her as an incredible partner here in Washington State. Good morning. Thank you, U.S. Attorney Waldruff. Medicaid dollars are a precious resource meant to care for the most vulnerable among us. All too often, fraudsters see it instead as a way to line their own pockets. That's where my office and you at the U.S. Attorney's Office come in. This case proves what we can accomplish with a strong state and federal partnership. Patients trust their doctors and that the care they receive is necessary, particularly when they're undergoing neurosurgery. I'm proud of the work we did with the U.S. Attorney and her team. I want to thank my team who worked tirelessly on this case. I'm joined today by Assistant Attorney General Doug Bowling, and I want to recognize the rest of the Medicaid fraud team. Forensic Analyst Tobias Moss and David McDonald, Assistant Attorney Generals Jeremy Kelly and Matt Keene, Special Agents Clay Coward and Scott Tollickson, Clinical Healthcare Investigators Robert Jones and Jody Watier. Paralegal Cindy Burke, and professional staff Don Weisner, Julie Vetter, and Kim Sobel. They put, in more than a they put in more than 100 hours and provided extremely technical analysis that was critical to the case. This case came about as a result of a whistleblower coming forward. Because one person decided to do the right thing, millions of Medicaid dollars will be protected. I encourage anyone who suspects Medicaid fraud or abuse in Washington to contact my office at 360-586-8888 or Mufuku Referrals, MFCU Referrals at atg.wa.gov. I look forward to continuing to work with the U.S. Attorney to combat Medicaid fraud and abuse in Washington. And now, the U.S. Attorney. Thank you, Larissa. So now I'd like to open up for questions, and I also will invite my assistant United States attorneys who investigated and uh, were very involved in this case to join me in answering questions. Yeah, so this case was brought by a whistleblower uh, under the False Claims Act. So that was a filing of a key TAM complaint. And I might pull in my experts on this one in terms of the actual precise timing. Uh, thanks, Vanessa. Uh, the, the case was first filed in February of 2020. Uh, and we started our investigation as soon as the case was filed. We were slowed down a little bit by COVID, which of course uh, started right after that, but we were able to expeditiously investigate uh, the case uh, since that time. So today's uh, announcement is about the settlement with Providence. This does not involve any other direct civil or criminal uh, investigations at this time, which we can't speak to, but the settlement does not preclude any further uh, civil or criminal uh, resolutions. Good question. So about $4 million will go to the whistleblower as provided by the False Claims Act. About $10 million of the settlement amount is designated as restitution, and that means that it will go back to the programs uh, where it was taken from, so Medicaid, Medicare, and other uh, federal programs. So that's about half of the funds will go back as restitution. 
about four million will go to the whistleblower, and the remainder of the recovery goes to the federal treasury, with about a three percent portion allocated to further enforcement efforts. And historically, this allocation, this three percent allocation of our recovery in the Eastern District of Washington, has been larger than the entire budget of the office, which reflects the value of this program from both the monetary perspective and an enforcement perspective. Yes. The reason that this uh, settlement was reached was because Providence was aware of what was going on. They had been receiving information from the uh, head of the neurosurgery neurosur department, and that was critical to the accountability that we are now holding uh, Providence to. The admitted statement of facts in the settlement agreement, which is public, sets forth that some Providence officers were aware of the concerns that the medical staff raised, and in fact that these neurosurgeons were engaging in fraud, hurting patients, and putting patients' health and life at risk. Providence also received you know, mixed feedback about these neurosurgeons, but that information were red flags, and we reached this resolution because Providence should have worked faster and done more to keep our patients safe. So we did not ask Providence to admit to liability, but the settlement agreement has a agreed upon statement of facts. And these statement of facts do have specific uh, statements from Providence that they received complaints regarding patient safety and patient care, that the incentive structure was based in a way to incentivize more complex surgeries than were medically necessary, and these are all critical aspects that we felt required that there be a agreement that required Providence to do more. To have this five-year independent corporate monitoring and compliance agreement between Providence and the United States Department of Health and Human Services Office of Inspector General. And under that agreement, Providence will be required to implement a more robust quality care program, and that includes training and employing personnel specifically designated to ensure compliance and patient care, so that we can make sure that this doesn't happen again. Do we know how many patients were affected? Hundreds. Yeah. Hundreds. So the settlement agreement has been reached and is finalized, and uh, it was unsealed yesterday as part of the KETAM uh, complaint that became available. But it is, it is a final settlement agreement as well as the corporate integrity agreement. So, so these surgeons, have they, have they lost their license? Do they still have Do you want to speak to that, Dan? Uh, sure. Uh, thanks, Vanessa. And again, uh, Dan Fruchter uh, with the U.S. Attorney's Office. Uh, one of the uh, surgeons uh, said his license uh, suspended um, and is still here uh, in the state of Washington, uh, but is not currently practicing. Uh, the other neuro neurosurgeon uh, left the state, and so we provided the information about that neurosurgeon to the appropriate uh, component of the Department of Justice with jurisdiction over where he's currently practicing. Well, thank you all for being here. I know my hands are very cold, so I appreciate everyone who's been able to hang out with us for this special time. We really appreciate uh, your engagement with this big, important issue, and my office is thrilled to be doing all that we can to build a safe and strong Eastern Washington. Thank you.